Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be looking at chapter 6. So chapter 6 is just kind of an overview chapter. So it tells you some of the different types of reactions that we'll be looking at in upcoming chapters throughout Organic Chemistry 1 and Organic Chemistry 2. And so the first thing we're going to go over is the different types of reactions that we'll see in Organic Chemistry. And a lot of these would be very similar to some of the reactions that you saw in general chemistry. So the first type will be an addition reaction. So an addition reaction is very similar to general chemistry, a combination reaction. So where two, react two reactants add together to form a single new product. So there I have two reactants and they've added together to form a single product. Now as we go on through these uh, reactions we'll look at in more detail exactly how they take place. So opposite of that is an elimination reaction where a single reactant splits into two products. So this is very similar to the gen chem reaction decomposition. So you start with one, end up with two. For organic chemistry, anytime you hear elimination reaction, you're going to be forming a double bond. Okay, so the next type of reaction that you'll see, and if you need to get all that down, you can uh, pause the screen. So the next thing we'll be looking at is a substitution reaction. Substitution reaction, two reactants change parts to form different products. So this is going to be like your single displacement or double displacement reaction that you saw on Gen Chem. So you see in this reaction here, a chlorine substituted on in place of chlorine or a chlorine and a hydrogen switch positions. So very similar to the double displacement reaction. But when organic chemistry look, we look at it as something substituting on in place of another atom. And the last uh, reaction, the last type of reaction we'll see in organic chemistry is a rearrangement reaction. And this one we don't see as very as often. So in a rearrangement reaction, a single reactant undergoes a reorganization of bonds and atoms to yield an isomeric product. So isomeric product still had the same molecular formula, but now the atoms are connected differently. So when you see rearrangement reactions, you'll see a product oftentimes rearrange to form a more stable product. And so if you can rearrange to form a more stable product, you'll see that happens a lot of time. So let's go ahead and 
look at some examples from your textbook. So this is 6-1. So it says classify each of the following reactions as addition, elimination, substitution, or rearrangement. So if I look at this first one, what's happening there? Okay, I just look at the products and look at the reactants. So you see that an OH is replacing your BR, your OH and BR switching places. So your OH is substituting on in place of your bromine. So that's a substitution reaction. If we look at the next one, okay, you're forming a double bond, or you have a single reactant splitting the two of them. So anytime you form a double bond, that is elimination. And then the last one here, We've got two reactants combining to form a single product, or the two hydrogens are adding to your double bond. So that is an example of an addition reaction. So now what we're going to look at is what's known as reaction mechanisms. So this is very similar to what we did before when we do resonance forms for different compounds. So when we do resonance forms, I used arrows to represent the movement of electrons. So reaction mechanisms, I'm using arrows again to show the movement of electrons, but you're doing this to show how a chemical transformation takes place. And so if you use a full-headed arrow, it represents the movement of two electrons. Half-headed arrow represents the movement of just one electron. So the first one we'll look at is a radical reaction. So we don't see these as often in organic chemistry. A lot of the reactions we'll look at will be polar reactions, but one example is a radical reaction. So radical reactions involve homolytic bond breaking, where one electron stays with each fragment, and homogenic bond making, where one electron is donated by each fragment. So when you show the movement of just one electron, that is a radical reaction. So if I was showing the homolytic bond breaking, remember the line represents two electrons. So when that bond breaks, one electron goes to each fragment. The product would be radical. So radical is when you just have the one electron. So, you show them this mechanism and to demonstrate the homogenic bond making. Again, you show this one electron combining with that one electron to form your chemical bond. Now most radical reactions will go through three different steps.
And we'll look at these, a reaction in particular, that one that I gave the example of, which if we go back and look at the substitution reaction, I had a reaction where it was CH4 plus Cl2, you will CH3Cl plus HCl. That's an example of radical reaction. And so that reaction takes place through three different steps. First one's initiation, and that's where you first form your radical. So the formation of your first radical, generation of your radicals. So if I have two, a chlorine molecule, get that, this is a UV light. This bond is unstable with UV light. So that bond will break to form your two chloride radicals. Propagation step is the addition of a radical and generation of a new radical. And so your radical adds to a molecule and the process generates a new one that can continue the reaction. And so I have my chloride radical. And this reaction can take place with any hydrogen in your molecule. So your chloride radical abstracts a hydrogen from your alkyl group, which so forms HCl. And in the process, it makes an alkyl radical. So I end up with HCl. HCl plus in this case, a methyl radical. So then that methyl radical can react with additional chlorine now. This radical can react with more chlorine now. And it creates a new chloride radical. And so if we go back to that problem where I talked about the different uh, types of reactions, You'll see that the products of the reaction are methyl chloride here in the HCA. So now this chlorine radical can interact with more of your methane to create HCl and not the methyl radical, which then begin to react with chlorine to make your product plus an organic chloride radical, which can then react with more methane. So the process can just repeat over and over. So that's what propagation is. You're doing the reaction, forming the reaction, and each step you're creating a new radical that can continue the reaction. Termination is when a reaction takes place that stops the reaction. And so a new radical is not made in the process. And so in this case, the termination step would be a combination of the two. So I could have chlorine combining with a methyl uh, radical. Okay, and so as you do this reaction, you have a lot of different radicals present. You have some methyl radicals present, you have some chloride radicals present, so you have all this going on, so if two of those came together, it'd form your completed product with no additional product being formed.
but you do have a lot of different methyl radicals and a lot of different chloride radicals present. So that's not the only termination step that could happen. You could also have two of your methyl radicals combining together. Or you could have two of your chloride radicals combining together. So there's some different termination steps that can take place there. So let's go on and look at another problem from your textbook. So we'll look at 6.2. It says radical chlorination of alkenes is not generally useful. Because mixtures of products often result. When more than one kind of CH bond is present in the substrate. Okay, so draw and name all monochlor substitution products. C6, H13, Cl, you might obtain from reaction of 2-methyl pentane with chlorine. So I have 2-methylpentane. You have to be able to draw 2-methylpentane. Reacting right, that with chlorine. So each type of hydrogen present there can be replaced with the chlorine. So each type of CH bond. So I have a couple different CH3s here. These two CH3s are equivalent. They're attached to the exact same thing. So I could draw a chlorine attached to one of those. My smart board's a little off, so my bond's a little off there. I have uh, one hydrogen here, so that hydrogen can be replaced with the chlorine. I have the CH2 here, so the two hydrogens there, so one of those could be replaced. Here I have another one, so I could replace one of those hydrogens with the chlorine. And then this CH3 is attached to a CH2. These two CH3s were attached to a CH, so these two CH3s are different than this one. So I could also have that hydrogen replaced with the chlorine. These two are equivalent, that's one product, that'd be another product, that hydrogen. So I have five different products that could form there. So that's why it's generally not a synthetically useful reaction, because you get so many different products. If you're trying to make, for example, this product, okay, you do the reaction and you get contamination from all these other products as well. So let's go on now and look at polar reactions. Polar reaction, electron sites in one molecule react with electron four sites in another molecule. So this is very similar to when we're drawing resonance structures. I showed you when you moved electrons, you always moved from electron rich source like a minus charge to electron four source 
positive charge, I always said to draw away from a negative and towards a positive. Same thing here. Electron rich sides in one molecule, reactive electron poor sides in another molecule. Curved areas are used to illustrate where electrons move when reactive bonds are broken and product bonds are formed. So polar reactions involve hydrolytic bond breaking. So in this case, two electrons stay with one fragment. So I can show those two electrons going up onto the B in this case. That B has extra electrons, so now it has a minus charge. And now it's taken away from A, so A is deficient in electrons. And we have a positive charge. Hydrogenic bond making, two electrons donate from one fragment. So that means B, with its extra electrons here, donates both electrons to form a bond to A. That'd be an example of heterogenic bond making. Both electrons are donated by that one fragment. Now we have some different terms to describe these different components in the chemical reaction. So the electron-rich species is termed the nucleophile. So in this case, B would be my nucleophile. Okay, It craves a nucleus to bond with. Electron-poor species is the electrophile. So A would be my electrophile. It's deficient, it has a positive charge. It's deficient in electrons. So it craves electrons. All polar reactions take place between electron poor site in, in one molecule and electron rich site in another molecule. It involves donation of electron pair from a nucleophile to an electrophile. So this is a very key point. Drawn mechanisms. The arrows start from a nucleophilic source. That nucleophilic source can be a negative charge, a lone pair of electrons, or a pi bond. Okay. Those are all nucleophilic sources. You can see a minus charge, lone pair, or a pi bond. And move towards an electrophilic sink, which would be a positive charge or something with a partial positive charge. So when drawing mechanism, always remember to start out where you have a negative charge, lone pair of electrons, or a pi bond. We're going to be talking about the alkene chapter in more detail next. And so in those cases, be our double bond that will be our nucleophile to start out each of the chemical reactions that we'll see that take place. So if we look at this example, it says which of the following species is likely to be an electrophile and which a nucleophile? And so if I look at the first one, eno 2 plus has a positive charge, so deficient electrons, that's going to be electrophile. Pretty easy there. Next one, Cn minus. It's got a minus charge. Again, pretty easy. It's minus charge, extra electrons. That's going to be my nucleophile. Now, anytime in organic chemistry you see a metal bonded to non-metal, you have an ionic bond. So you'll, whatever has the, is the non-metal will have a minus charge to it. And so instead of saying Cn minus, what you could see written out would be NACN. Okay. If I look at this next one, I have CH3OH. This one's a little more difficult. I have a lone pair of electrons. So since I have a lone pair of electrons, 
be a nuclear bomb. So, nuclear those pairs can be a nuclear uh, lone pair of electrons nucleophilic, and so that molecule could behave as a nucleophile. I also have polar covalent bonds. So since I have polar covalent bonds, it means I also have some partial positive charges. And so since I have partial positive charges, he could also behave as an electrophile. So on that one, that molecule could be either a nucleophile or an electrophile, depending on what it's reacting with. Let's go ahead and look at another problem from your textbook. So 6-4 says, which of the following species are likely to be nucleophiles and which electrophiles, which might be both? So here I have CH3Cl. So I have a halogen, halogen electronegative, and so it pulls electrons towards it. And so that'll be partial negative, partial positive, okay? And so that's generally going to be with its partial positive charge there electrophile. Now you might be thinking more chlorine has some lone pairs of electrons on it. But generally when chlorine and halogens bonded to a carbon, those lone pairs are not nucleophilic. What you see is nucleophilic would be lone pairs on like an oxygen, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, those types of electrons on those atoms would be could be nucleophilic. Here, the next one B, I have a CH3S minus, so I have a minus charge. So anytime you have a minus charge, nucleophilic. Here I have some nitrogens. Nitrogens have lone pairs of electrons. Lone pairs of electrons, nucleophilic. If I look at D, okay, I have CH3, C double bond O. And so the oxygen, lone pair of electrons, can be nucleophilic. But it's also polar covalent bond. 
part of an oxygen, very poor bond. So electrons will pull closer to the oxygen. So it has a partial negative, making that carbon there electrophilic. So this would be an example where molecule could behave as both. So look at some thermodynamics of organic reactions. And we'll look at a specific reaction and apply thermodynamics to it. So every reaction going either the forward or reverse direction, reaction to be favored. The energy of the products must be lower in energy than the reactants. Exothermic reactions release energy. Products more stable than the reactants. Endothermic reactions absorb energy, meaning the products are less stable than the reactants. Energy changes can be depicted graphically using reaction energy diagrams, where the vertical axis represents the energy and the horizontal axis represents the reaction progress. So let's review those quickly. Seen some this in Jane Kim reaction coordinate diagram. So reaction going this way. Look at your energy here. So it's something like this. One example. So, so here are your reactants. Here are your products. So, energy difference. And we know energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And so, the reactants are higher in energy than the products. So, since they have more energy, uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So, that energy must be released to the surroundings. So, this would be an example. exothermic reaction. So this would be an endothermic my reactant, here's my products. So the products are higher in energy than the reactants, so it must have gained energy from the reaction. So it takes in, you have to put energy into it. And so that would be an example of an endothermic reaction. The highest energy state involved in the reaction is termed transition state. And so that's what we call this here. That would be a transition state. There is an example of the transition state in that one. So it goes to this transition state. The transition state resembles both the reactants and the products. The energy difference between the reactants and transition state is called activation energy. So I'm looking at this energy here between the reactants and the transition state. that would be the activation energy. So here, this would have a much larger activation energy. A large activation energy results in slow reaction time. Likewise, smaller activation energy results in fast reaction times. And fast reaction times mean that will take place at or sometimes even below room temperature. A reaction intermediate may also exist, which is lower in energy 
be in the transition state. Let's show an example of that. So here, I have my reactants. Here are my products. Okay. So I see this little dip here. So this is what's known as the reaction intermediate. Okay. So in this case, I have two transition states. Okay. Again, an example of an exothermic reaction. The difference between the intermediate and transition state is that you can isolate an intermediate. You cannot isolate transition states. Transition states are only assumed or speculated to exist. You can isolate an intermediate and actually prove that, yeah, it goes through this intermediate in the reaction. So let's look at an example. Before we look at an example of an addition reaction, we're going to look at that example again in more detail and apply it to these reaction coordinate diagrams. Look at this reaction. So this is the addition reaction. If you go back, you add an H to one side, uh, bromine to the other side. So let's also go back and look and see what we uh, learned about drawing reaction mechanisms. Okay. So I always start drawing my arrows from my electron rich source. So I'll look at this and say, okay, minus charge, no. Lone pair of electrons. Well, on the bromine, but it's not minus charge, so it's not a very good nucleophile. But I do have the pi electrons of my double bond, so that's my nucleophile. That's where I'm going to draw my arrows from. Where I draw my arrows to? Well, look at my other molecule. Halogen, electronegative, pulls electrons towards it, so that must be that hydrogen has a partial positive charge on it. And so these two electrons form a bond to that hydrogen. These two, I can't have two bonds to hydrogen though, so I have two electrons between the hydrogen and the bromine. So those two electrons then go up onto the bromine. Okay. So what that would then look like Hydrogen has to add to one of those carbons, so I'm just going to add it to one. Wherever it added to, okay, I have two carbons that have double bonds, so one of them add that hydrogen, leaves a positive charge on the other carbon. Okay. What else did I create here? A bromide ion. Okay. And so now, if I identify my nucleophile, I have something with minus charge. I have something with a positive charge. So, nucleophile, electrophile. Always go from my nucleophilic source, extra electrons, to my electrophile.
And so you get the product that we that I showed at the very start, the example of an addition reaction. Now, relating this back to your the energy diagrams, this positive charge here, that's what's known as an intermediate. And so it'd be a little dip in the energy diagram. You can prove that it goes through this positive charge. So we call this, since we have a positive charge there, and it's on a carbon, we have a positive charge, remember from 10 Ken, we call that a cation. When it's on a carbon, we call that a carbocation. So I have a carbocation, so this reaction proceeds to a carbocation intermediate because it has that positive charge there. Transition states would be you could put like a dashed line here, show that bond starting to break, and showing the bond to hydrogen starting to form. This bond starting to break, so you just have some partial bonds there, and that'd be your transition, your first transition state. Your second transition state, you can just start showing that bond. So you use like some dots there to show that bond from the bromine to carbon starting to form. So that'd be your two transition states. When we draw reaction mechanisms, we'll just be drawing the intermediates for the reaction. We won't be drawing the transition states for that reaction. So let's go ahead and work some problems in the textbook. So this is 6.6. .6. This is what product would you expect from reaction of cyclohexene with HBr with HCl. So look and see, okay, I have a double bond there, cyclohexene, HBr. So I know for my addition reaction, I just saw, H has to one side, bromine has to the other side of my double bond. So I draw it without the double bond. Put an H on one side and the bromine on the other side. If I was doing the line structure, remember hydrogens are not generally shown. There's actually another hydrogen there any place. So you could just draw it like that. Now it says with HCl, it's going to be the exact same thing, except instead of adding a bromine, you'd add we'll look at the next one, 6.7. This is reaction of HBr with 2-methylpropane yields 2-bromo-2-methylpropane. What is the structure of the carbocation formed during the reaction? Show the mechanism of the reaction. So let's show the mechanism of that reaction. So I know my first step in the reaction mechanism, start from my double bond, go to my electrophilic sink, my hydrogen, partial to positive charge. So my hydrogen will add to one side, other side I'll form that carbocation intermediate.
So I drew it without the double bond there. So which side adds hydrogen, which side adds a bromine? Well, I know whichever side adds the hydrogen, the other side has bromine. I look up my product, see my bromine is attached to that middle carbon. So I know if the bromine attaches there, that must be where my positive charge was. Okay, that means the hydrogen added to the CH2 over here. So I'll just make that a CH3. Or you can show your hydrogen added to it. I also have my bromide ion. So now negative to positive. And I have my product that I see formed. Okay. So bromide goes there. I'll show the structure of the carbocation intermediate that's formed. We're going to go over this reaction in much more detail in the next chapter. And so we'll look and see exactly why the positive charge went to the carbon that it did and why the hydrogen went to the carbon that it did too. We've got some additional practice, so we, we can practice drawing some arrows. In your homework, you'll have a lot of practice as well. Okay, so I have, I'm going to be able to, this makes it fairly easy because I can actually see the products. So I can kind of see what needs to be happening there. So I had curved arrows that following polar reactions indicate the flow of electrons in each. So I'll look at this first one. I look, okay, why is the lone pair? Well, remember I said lone pairs on halogens, not very nucleophilic. But I have a nitrogen here, so that could be nucleophilic. So where would I draw that, that lone pair to? If I look at my product, I see it's forming a bond to a chlorine. So I'm going to go from that lone pair to a chlorine. And then the two electrons that form your bond and chlorine molecule go up on the other chlorine, so you end up with your Cl minus. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I look at the next one, I have look at what I have here. Oxygen minus charge, nucleophilic. Polar covalent bond, bromine electronegative, pulls electrons towards it. So partial positive charge. Here, non-polar covalent bond, but with all your all the chlorine molecules that you have in solution, there'll be a few of them where the electrons are all here closer to one chlorine than another, which would create a partial positive, and that's why that reaction proceeds. Here it's easier to see because of the polar covalent bond, and the majority of them are going to have that partial positive charge left. So minus charge. So look at my product that's forming the bond to that methyl group. So my partial positive, so negative to partial positive, goes to that carbon. And the two electrons formed on bond to that bromine here would go up onto the bromine to make my Br minus. On your online homework, when you do this, if you was clicking on your arrows, you could click right on that bond. And then click on the bromine to actually show that the arrow is going, those two electrons are going up onto that bromine. Next one here. Again, I have a minus charge. If I look at the product of what's happening there, it's forming a double bond. Okay. And so 
my, my minus charge, I see that's formed a double bond. So I'm just going to move those two electrons down to form a double bond. Well, I can't have five bonds to a carbon. So why I see that it kicked off a chlorine. I have a Cl minus here. That means these two electrons bonded to chlorine come off onto the chlorine. So again, I'm just following the electrons to show how that product formed over there. We've got one more problem to go through to almost made it to the first video. So this one says, predict the products of the following polar reaction, a step in the citric acid cycle for fluid metabolism by interpreting the flow of electrons indicated by the curved arrows. So before we was looking at the reaction and say using the arrows to show how that transformation took place. Now I'm going to look at arrows to see what product that could possibly be. So I'm just going to go through step by step. So OH2 bonding to this carbon. So I'm going to draw that. And then I have the CO2 minus here. OH2 is bonded there, so I'm just forming a bond there. So there's two, two electrons there. So that carbon, that oxygen, I mean, is going to have a formal charge. Now it's showing that these two electrons are forming a bond to hydrogen. We well, can't form a bond here, but this one can form the bond to the hydrogen. So what else do I have? I still have my CH2, CO2 minus attached. So I have the CO2 minus attached over here. So I'll show bonding to that hydrogen. Now these two electrons go up onto this oxygen. So it was H3O plus, so now it's just going to become H2O. Well, that's it for this chapter, which is chapter six, an overview of chemical reactions. And that will be the finish of the lecture for the, uh, for the day. So I'll see you in the next lecture.